Well, hello, welcome. My name is Anissa Khan, and I'm a third year student here at COA. Firstly, thank you all for coming to this event that is bound to be fantastic. Um, we here at COA are extremely pleased and excited to have our two guests, Amy and David Goodman, here to talk about their new book, Democracy Now! 20 Years Covering the Movements Changing America. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, quick story time. In 2014, I went to Lima, Peru, to the United Nations Climate Conference with a few other students from the college. Out of all the moments that I clearly remember from those two intense weeks, one in particular stuck with me. A friend and I were standing in the middle of the conference center, and we were talking while eating seemingly unending ice cream cones when he stopped and his mouth fell wide open. Believe me, there is no one in the world that I know that loves ice cream more than he does, so this was quite the shocker. He then grabbed my arm and pointed out at someone who had a camera facing her and said very slowly and very loudly, oh my God, it's Amy Goodman. <laughs> Amy Goodman, do you know who she is? She's the best, I'm a huge fan of Democracy Now!, she is my idol. Though familiar with the radical work of Democracy Now!, this was my first encounter with Amy. As I stood there and watched her look with determination into the camera under the blazing Peruvian sun, and as I watched my friend's wide-eyed face as his ice cream melted under the same sun, I thought to myself, wow, she's really saying the right stuff. I then downloaded the Democracy Now! app, which I highly recommend. <laughs> so, besides an awe-inspiring, ice cream dripping worthy journalist, who is Amy Goodman? Amy is the co-founder, executive producer, and host of Democracy Now!, a national, daily independent, award-winning news program airing on over 1,400 public television and radio stations worldwide, including We Are You, 89.9 in Blue Hill. Um, she was born in Washington, D.C. and graduated from Radcliffe College in 1984 with a degree in anthropology. Amy has received the American Women in Radio and Television Gracie Award, the Paley Center for Media She's Made It Award, and the Puffin Nation Prize for Creative Citizenship. Her reporting on East Timor and Nigeria has won numerous awards, including the George Polk Award and the Robert F. Kennedy Prize for International Reporting. Time Magazine named Democracy Now! its pick of the podcast. Amy is also the first journalist to receive the Right Livelihood Award, widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for developing an innovative model of truly independent grassroots political journalism that brings to millions of people the alternative voices that are often excluded from the mainstream media. I think that this perfectly describes her work and how much of a dedicated and innovative journalist she is. Also, fun fact about Amy, and I think that some of you might not know this, she went to COA for a while. And through the grapevine, I managed to hear something else. And please correct me if I'm wrong, Amy. During her brief time at COA, she helped run the Sunflower Bakery in Bar Harbor, where Agnes started out before opening up the bagel factory. Anyway, the good journalist genes run in the family, and we are also extremely lucky to have Amy's brother, David Goodman, here with us today. David, an award-winning journalist himself, has co-authored multiple New York Times bestsellers with Amy. He's a contributing writer for Mother Jones, and he has reported from Sudan, Liberia, and elsewhere throughout Africa on war, AIDS, and the plight of women and children. He traveled secretly inside apartheid Africa, South Africa, during the 1980s and 90s, and later covered Nelson Mandela and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and wrote an eyewitness chronicle of South Africa's transformative journey from apartheid to democracy. Goodman's articles have appeared in the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Outside, Christian Science Monitor, Boston Globe, The Nation, and numerous other publications. Amy and David's book, Democracy Now!, 20 Years Covering the Movements Changing America, is yet another New York Times bestseller, and it does what they do best, tells the untold and the powerful stories. It looks at the movements and charismatic leaders who are reshaping our world. They take the reader along as they go where the silence is, bringing out the voices of the streets from Ferguson to Wall Street to East Timor and other places where people are rising up to demand justice. Amy, David, we are so happy to have you here to celebrate 20 years of Democracy Now! and your new book. Thank you so much. And David will be speaking to us first.
So now that Anissa has revealed the secret of Amy's COA years, <clears throat> I can elaborate a little as uh, her brother um, how this went down in the family. <laughs> so Amy uh, was, had just finished two years uh, as an undergraduate at Harvard um, and announced to the family she was done and uh, wanted to go find some place that was challenged her more, that broke down the boundaries that she felt handcuffed by in a conventional you know, learning institution like Harvard, a place where there were free thinkers. Now, I'm t two and a half years younger than her. I think I was about to start college, and I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> What could you ask for more than a big university where you can do anything, see anything? But she was a few miles ahead of me at that point. So not only was she going to go in search of this place, she then explained she was going to go to what we all figured was the ends of the earth <laughs> and then fall off it. <laughs> Some place called Bar Harbor, Maine, where there was a college called College of the Atlantic. You know, as your younger brother just starting college, I was like, whatever, okay, that's, there's my sister doing my sister's thing and walking away from what seemed like limitless opportunities to I didn't know what. Well, on my visits up here, because, and Amy will talk more about her Bar Harbor years, which expanded to be three or five or something, I remember just driving up here and discovering this wondrous community. Uh, of truly free thinkers, of thinking beyond the boundaries, something that as I was in college, um, I had never really experienced. And um, it's just wonderful to come back here and also to see what COA has evolved into. Um, but enough of me on COA, Amy will have more to say on it, but I also have fond memories of seeing this place in its more or less in its infancy and, and what it has become today and how important a place like this is in our world. Um, so for those of you who hear Democracy Now! on WERU or see it on the internet, you may wonder a little bit about um, where did this person come from? Um, how did she get to see and think and, and uh, the way that she is? Um, so I can give you a little family insight on that. Amy has been, Amy, I think a democracy now really evolved from our kitchen table in our home. And it was a place where we routinely had a lot of debate. We had, uh, in the extended family, all sides represented at that table from the, our older generation. Um, we had a, our, our uncle on one side who was an insurance salesman and a socialist, and on the other side, an underwear salesman on the Lower East Side who was a staunch conservative. And it would take, I don't know, somewhere between the appetizer and the main course before full-scale war broke out between Uncle Sock and Uncle Joe. And that was just repeated at every extended family gathering. And, you know, we just kind of got used to it. That's what went on at the kitchen table. Um, war between the uncles, and then that would, of course, spill over into the rest of the family. So we were always debating things. And uh, when Amy l embarked on her career as a journalist, um, she didn't really think about staying within those boundaries, uh, same as when she was in college. And so she felt it was her mission to go to where the silence is, to find the voices that we weren't hearing in the mainstream news. That's what led her in 1991 to go to a place of deep silence, East Timor, a small island nation a few hundred miles uh, north of Australia that had essentially had an iron curtain pulled around it by Indonesia in the mid-1970s when the Indonesian military launched an invasion and occupation and then shut off access to the outside world. And of course, one of their first jobs in the, in the invasion was to kill all the journalists, which they did. 
they killed a crew of Australian journalists who were based there and simply executed them. Um, silencing the journalists is, of course, the first move of any dictatorial regime or even any regime that understands how you can control the people. Turn off the spigots of truth. Turn off the spigots of reality, of different viewpoints, of dissent. When Amy was in East, so Amy traveled to East Timor with um, her colleague, Alan Nairn, and uh, what they saw there was a country that had been shut off from the outside world for nearly 20 years, and a genocide had taken place outside of the sight, view, and earshot of the rest of the world. One third of the population of East Timor had been killed by the Indonesian military. And this wasn't just any military. It was one that was operating with US weapons and US support. When Amy and Alan were in the capital, Dili, a massacre occurred and they found themselves caught in the crossfire. These were ordinary, peaceful protesters, and to protest in East Timor and in so many other lands like it is to take your life in your hands. Dissent is an act of utmost uh, uh, threat to those trying to maintain control, power, and wealth. Amy and Alan were... Uh, the soldiers raised their guns to them. Amy, uh, Alan threw himself over Amy to protect her, and the soldiers took their U.S.-made M16 rifles and began swinging at his head like baseball bats until they fractured his skull. Miraculously, in this story, we tell this story in the book here. It is the epilogue. Um, Amy and Alan escaped to tell the world to pull back that iron curtain simply by being witnesses and by using the media as a tool for peace. And it was the beginning of the end, a long torturous end that took nearly a decade for that occupation and genocide to end. But it ended and Indonesia and East Timor is now a free country. Well, in 1995, Amy was a news reporter at the station WBAI in New York and um, was covering elections in Haiti and was in a safe house. Now, picture that. We're in an election year here, too. Um, you don't usually have to hide in safe houses if you support the opposition candidate, although we may soon have to hide in safe houses. <laughs> well, in Haiti, bullets were flying, and... Um, Amy gets a phone call from Pacifica Radio asking if she would host an election show back in the United States. The election was the 1996 re-election campaign of Bill Clinton. He was running against Senator Bob Dole and a billionaire who thought by virtue of his wealth, good looks, and power that he could uh, you know, take control and change the world. Uh, no, his name was Ross Perot. Um, he didn't do very well. So when Amy reported back to the family that she had been asked to host an election show, well, we were back at the kitchen table where I very helpfully offered my feedback on the idea of the show she proposed. You're going to call it Democracy Now? Who's going to listen to something called Democracy Now who isn't related to you? No. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that. You need to just go stealth, you know? Just give it a name like, you know, Good Times with Amy, and they'll, <laughs> they'll wedge it between Top 40 and, you know, a doo-wop show. I mean, just, you know, lay low and kind of just infiltrate at the ground level. Um, my parents were, and, and uh, it is in a sign of many things to come and already things to, that had preceded it, uh, Amy's defying conventional wisdom, of course, began with her family. Uh, she very happily ignored, thankfully, my bad advice. Um, my parents, on the other hand, were thrilled. Finally, Amy, their daughter, was going to have a boring desk job. <laughs> no more calls, midnight calls from embassies on the other side of the world saying, uh, your daughter's in a little trouble, we'll get back to you, we're not sure of the details. 
Um, we would always joke when Amy would leave to far off places like Nigeria and Haiti, you know, don't cause an international incident. <laughs> Within about 72 hours, we were getting phone calls about the international incident that uh, we might want to be informed of. So anyway, mom and dad felt like, wow, she'll just be like Walter Cronkite, you know, just sit in a chair in New York, be the voice of God, and just tell us who's hot, who's not, and it's all over after election day, and you can move on to another boring de desk job. This would be progress. Well, as those of you who have followed democracy now over the years, uh, my parents' fervent wish for a calm, peaceful nights of rest um, were not to become true. Uh, Amy, we have in the beginning of the book uh, an independent reporter's rap sheet. It's Amy's rap sheet for daring to, uh, for the way that she got a record for putting things on the record. And that continues. Uh, being detained as she, when she tried to return to East Timor in 1999, uh, arrested uh, and detained twice by the Indonesians uh, to keep her from reporting that from there. Covering, uh, being arrested uh, as she was covering a plowshares uh, m uh, action. These are the uh, people from uh, the Catholic Worker, led by the late great father Dan Berrigan, uh, Phil Berrigan, and others uh, who would smash nuclear warheads as an act of protest. Arrested with great women writers like Terry Tempest Williams and Alice Walker as she was covering their protest in front of the White House. Um, Arrested in 2008 at the uh, Republican National Convention in Minnesota as she was covering the protest there. You see a theme here, which is the police, uh, it's very efficient. As long as you're taking the protesters, why don't we just try and silence any ability to cover the protest? The problem is it never really works out that way because democracy now is going on the air immediately with the news, like when she was arrested trying to travel into that mortal enemy, our sworn enemy, the nation of Canada, <laughs> where she was traveling uh, just before the Vancouver Winter Olympics a few years ago. She was traveling and was detained at the Canadian border because she was about to give a speech at the Vancouver Public Library on the importance of a free media. So. These are the ways that Amy has continued that tradition that she began and kind of began here, going to where the silence is. And the real story, the real underpinnings of that is the idea that the news, the change in the world is generated not by those in corporate suites or in the towers of government, but it's by you, turning the microphones and the cameras on you. The real change makers are the movements, the people in the communities at so many other kitchen tables where people are coming together and that's what democracy now brings you. So that when you read something in the New York Times or see something on CNN today, you actually saw it on Democracy Now! a year ago. It's a telltale litmus test of how well Democracy Now! is doing. It's catching these things where the change is generated. That's why Democracy Now! has been the voice and brought you news of the Occupy movement, the movement against inequality, long before it erupted on Wall Street. The movement against climate change, the LGBTQ movement, the movement against mass incarceration, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of these have been chronicled, and when the uprising bursts onto the front page, often the only front page, or the first front page it makes, is Democracy Now! That's where you hear about it. And so, Democracy Now! is the place that you go, that I go, to know that you're not crazy, and you're not alone. So, 20 years later, and it's hard to even believe that that's when, how long it's been since Amy brought that news to my parents, both of my, our amazing parents who have now since passed on, but are, were so proud of what Amy did, uh, not just from Democracy Now!, but 
Even when she traveled to the ends of the earth, some little place called Bar Harbor, Maine, to go to the College of the Atlantic to think beyond the boundaries, to see differently, to speak truth to power. Democracy now continues to be the beating heart of all of these movements, the big kitchen table where the connective tissue, where the immigrant rights folks can talk to the LGBTQ rights folks who are also talking to the climate change activists, so that these movements have a place of belonging and connection. And so 20 years after it began, uh, we can tip our hat to the most courageous, cora uh, compassionate, and essential journalist in America who keeps us all connected, my sister Amy. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's such an honor to be with all of you. And David is really a trustworthy journalist and a fantastic writer, but don't believe the last part of what he said. Um, other than that, he's really terrific. Um, it is so great to be back in Bar Harbor, to be back home here at College of the Atlantic. What a thrill this is. And Anissa, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And um, to look out here and uh, to see Robert Phipps in the audience uh, is an absolutely beautiful thing. Uh, we just stopped in unexpectedly, and I didn't even think to knock on the door because I always thought of the Sunflower Bakery as a very open space. That's 122 Cottage Street, and it's somehow missing its sunflower on the window. So I got a little lost, but the broken glass that had been there for many decades, that clued me in that I was in the right place. Um, but uh, we just walked in upstairs. I said, wait, I understand the stairs used to come right up through the floor. It was just a big open space, and I'm not sure I had to get into the space. David said, I think someone lives there. I see bicycles downstairs. I said, no, 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 don't worry. I'm sure it's open, and then I opened the door, and there were people there, but yes, it, <laughs> it then dawned on me this might be like private property. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> if Robert lives here anymore, but they said sure enough. And um, what I'm talking about is the Sunflower Bakery that we, um, it was a collective that we, um, that I was a part of um, after and during being here at uh, College of the Atlantic. And what a relief it was to come here. When I first visited the school, a uh, close friend of mine named Enno Becker had been here, and I was just amazed at the way he thought, the way he put things together, the, just the way he saw everything as interconnected. And I know it was very much just whoever he was, but I also said, where did you go to school? <laughs> and he said, oh, this place called College of the Atlantic, so I was on the next bus up. And um, not exactly, but something like that. And when I showed up, I was taken around to the classes. And I had come from such a strict, regulated environment. And I came into the classes, and everyone was knitting. And so <laughs> I said to the person who took me around, I said, oh, is this a knitting class? <laughs> and they said, what do you, we don't have a knitting class. So I said, but what are they all doing? Even though the teacher was like talking about biology, but I said, what are they all doing? And um, he said, they're knitting. I said, I know, but this is a class. They said, well, right, that's what they do. They focus and they knit. I said, well, what about taking notes? No, this is how they sort of take it in. I was blown away, I said, really. <laughs> um, uh, but, and then looking out on Frenchman's Bay that you could ever actually see something beautiful from a classroom. Um, and coming back here today, seeing on the names and all the buildings, they were, these were the people who um, were, they weren't buildings, they were actual people. You know, the Davis <laughs> Student Center here, that's Dick Davis. I knew him well, right? He taught Whitehead and Whitewater. And that's when students would go whitewater rafting and talk about Whitehead. Um, Kelber Hall, that was Ed Kelber, the president. 
And, um, but it's wonderful, not that you've institutionalized them, but, <laughs> and Ann Peach. Uh, you know, it's really something uh, to be back here because it is a family and is a community. Um, and I just read the latest discussion about um, the goals of the school and talking with the students from Earth and Brackets just now over at Turrets. I mean, I spent so many hours at Turrets. It was just really being sort of built up at the time. And a guy named Than James, a student, was building this massive globe that I was helping him with. And I would read to him Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, I'm not sure why, sitting on the floor as he would make this paper mache massive globe that hung there for so many years. Um, it's so incredible to come back because I really think of College of the Atlantic as the place I learned to critically think, to put everything together. I had felt for so long, I mean, my family was spending so much money for me to protest, because that's what I was doing mainly in college before I came to COA. Um, there was so much to protest. The university at the Times investments in South Africa, how could we go on in our way learning in this um, world-renowned university when uh, the university was profiting off of apartheid? And there were so many issues there that, I mean, one night my mother called me and said, where are you? I said, well, I've just come from the library. Why? And she said, well, I mean, I have a picture of you, she said, with your fist in the air, standing at the admin building, shutting it down. I said, Ma, come on, that was last night. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you shouldn't have to pay for that. And I thought, this is getting pretty expensive. And I also was yearning for a place that I really could um, really, with other people, um, come to understand the world, dig deep, read and write, and talk with other people um, without shutting down administration building every night. Uh, and so I came here, and I had a truly wonderful time, and then put some of what I learned into practice at the Sunflower Bakery. We tried to um, form, we formed a collective. We made thousands of loaves of whole grain macrobiotic bread, uh, oatmeal sesame bread, oatmeal raisin cookies, peanut butter cookies, granola, thousands of pounds. And every week I would drive this little green truck, which we called Fiddlehead, down the coast of Maine, delivering the bread, granola, and cookies. I mean, it was, it was becoming a major industry. I, my, but the coup, the idea, my, what my goal was to get this bread into the public schools of Maine. Uh, particularly in Bar Harbor, but we couldn't compete with Wonder Bread, which could sit on a shelf for two years. Um, but then I said, if that bread sits on the shelves for two years and the kids eat it, they won't be able to compete in the world, right? They need something healthy. We just, though, couldn't compete there. Um, but then something interesting happened. Um, I mean, we had the whole bakery, and we would provide the bread to the co-ops, the grocery stores, and the bodegas of Maine. And I got a call one day. It was in the morning. It was, um, and I was always wearing the same thing. I had this orange felt hat, and it was covered in flour. Um, and uh, this uh, apron what, uh, over whatever I was wearing. I never even thought about it. It was sort of my uniform. And I get this call, and um, the guy said, okay, I'd like to put an order. I said, sure, what would you like? And he said, um, I would like you have whole wheat buns. I said, sure. And he said, 10,000, please. I said, excuse me? And so he said, we'd like 10,000 buns. And so I said, you want 10,000 whole wheat buns? He said, yes, a week, please. I said, 10,000 buns a week? So I said, who is this? So he said, my name is Ken Raffle. I said, Ken Raffle? He said, yes, Raffle Brothers, Arby's. So I said, Ra Arby's? I thought it stood for roast beef. Well, it was actually the Raffle family that owned Arby's. Uh, I didn't know this until then. They started, I believe, in Maine, or anyway, they had you know, the national franchise. And Royal Crown brought the, bought the franchise. They kept the three Arby's in Maine. Not that I knew anything about it or had ever stepped foot in one. Um, and so I said, wait a second, what time is it? He said, what are you talking about? I said, what time is it? I need to know. He said, it's 5 to 12. I said, can you call me back at 5 after 1? 
He said, I said I want to put in an order for 10,000 buns a week, and you're telling me to call you back. I said, no, I have to get to the post office at noon because I had made this sign that every single day, uh, it was a sign that said peace on earth, and it was a peace sign with a globe in it. And I would run to the post offices before the internet, and everyone went to the post office then, and this was the busiest time. And I would stand there with the poster and have these fantastic conversations with people. Um, <laughs> and it was it's noon to one. You know, people got off work, they had their lunch. I had to be there at that minute because what if I missed the first person who was coming into the post office? I was religious about this. And so he said, I said that I want to put an order for 10,000 buns a week, and you said you want to go to the post office and hold up a sign that says peace on earth. I said, sir, which is more important, a piece of bread or peace on earth? He said, okay, I'll call you back at five after one. <laughs> so I did run back after uh, my little vigil, um, and at five after one, he called, ring, hello? Hello, this is Ken Raffle. I said, hello, Mr. Raffle. Can I help you now? Can I take your order? And he said, I just want to know if you achieved it. I said, achieved what? He said, peace on earth. I said, oh, I said, no, no, no. I said, that will take much more than me or you or your customers and my customers and, well, our whole communities, but we're going to have to do it together. Now, you would like 10,000 buns a week? And he said, that's right. Um, we'd like to start offering organic whole wheat buns at Arby's. And I said, oh my gosh. He said, we'll send up freezer trucks. I said, I couldn't fit them in Fiddlehead, which is our little green pickup truck. No, no, we'll send up tr freezer trucks to uh, your bakery and we'll pick them up every week. I said, all right. And he said, I'd like to come and inspect your property. And Robert would know why this would cause great concern thinking about that broken... <laughs> We had pizza ovens where we bake the bread, and um, I said, actually, Mr. Raffel, I'd like to come inspect yours. And he said, fine, come. I said, great, because I've never been in Arby's. So I drove Fiddlehead down to Arby's with all the bread in it and stopped off for the first time ever at Arby's with my bag of the six prototype whole week macrobiotic buns. I walk in, who knew there was a conference room behind Arby's in Portland, but there was. And so I walked in, they ushered me to back, a group of guys were there. I shook hands with Ken Raffley and he said, okay, so how much are you gonna charge us? So I said, well, I've been thinking a lot about this as I scratched my flower covered orange felt hat. Um, I said, I think I need to know one more bit of information. He said, what's that? I said, how much do you pay for the white buns? And I believe he said 0.5 cents. I said, 0.5 cents per bun? He said, yes. I said, okay. I was going to say 10 cents, but for you, nine cents. He said, wait a second. He said, so you have this bag of six buns and you're gonna charge us nine cents for them. I told you 0.5 cents a bun. I said, what do you mean nine cents for the bag? No, nine cents per bun. He said, what are you talking about? I told you 0.5 cents. I said, I know, that's why I reduced it from 10 cents to nine cents. <laughs> he said, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so that's how our relationship started. And these guys would drive up these freezer tractor trucks. We would be blowing the, trying to cool down the buns because to make 10,000, put them in plastic bags, you don't want to close it until they're cool or else they'll get all soggy, right? And we're figuring out this science and we have to do 10,000 at once. Um, we bring the guys into the restaurant and we would serve them our special DLTs, dulce, lettuce, and tomato, um, to just keep them occupied while we tried to figure out. And they would take those buns and they had local art, they had our artists draw big posters that appeared in Arby's. And the fact is he really was a pioneer. Um, he was work, the first one to work with farmers in the area in these fast food franchises to have salad bars. And when I would come down to visit, uh, bringing the bread to Good Day Market in Portland, I'd stop by Arby's and he'd have me taste the vegetarian soups because he really wanted to push that. Um, so it was a very interesting relationship. But then I realized, my God, the whole point of doing Sunflower was to have a profit-making arm to serve the educational center. You know, we would have a Salvadoran night, serve Salvadoran food, and then talk about Salvadoran politics, but we couldn't quite ever get to that because we were becoming increasingly successful. <laughs> so I decided to go back to school. <laughs> um, but it was such... 
it was it was really just a wonderful project, and I think so fondly of that place. And I could wish I could be there tonight for your um, for the potluck you're going to have. As well, maybe that building will no longer be there for us physically, but um, it will always be there in my mind and heart. As will College of the Atlantic, because it was such an important place of community that you could be with people enjoying yourselves and deeply learning about the world, um, being deeply steeped in the world, this whole idea of getting a degree in human ecology. And there isn't a speech I give now where I don't talk about College of the Atlantic. Um, so uh, we're on this 100 city tour and it's been quite amazing. I think this is like, town or city 60. Um, maybe three a day in the morning we have to do the show wherever we are. So when you're listening on WERU, or how many of you listen on WERU? How many of you watch online or listen at democracynow.org? Um, how many of you have never heard of Democracy Now and you stumbled in this morning <laughs> to this lovely place? But anyway, in all cases, it's very exciting because even for you to discover Democracy Now, I mean, I just spoke at Barnes & Noble in New York, and that was really amazing because a lot of people there are total devotees of Democracy Now, but a lot of people were just in the store. Like one woman came up after me, she asked me to sign her book, she said, I don't even know what this is. She said, I just, she said, I couldn't believe what I was hearing on the third floor, so I came up to the fourth floor. They had to, they had to shut down the escalators because people kept coming up. Um, and that is such an important way to do outreach in the most unexpected places. Um, so we're on this tour, and we were in San Francisco, one of the many times we were racing to San Francisco Airport over, these la over this last month. Um, first, I want to thank David, my brother, fantastic journalist, great writer, um, together with Dennis Moynihan, colleague at Democracy Now!, co-author of our weekly column for King Features, who really helped to build Democracy Now! from the nine community stations that it was started on in 1996 as the only daily election show in public broadcasting. In fact, now we've been to all the stations that started with Democracy Now!, those nine stations. The last one last night in Bangor, celebrating We Are You. I haven't even heard of it called We Are You. And Anissa said that, and I said, wow, that's a great way to talk about it. We Are You. So We Are You here in Maine, uh, W-E-R-U. Um, Chaos in Olympia, Washington, K-A-O-S, which is Olympia is also home to the sort of equivalent on the West Coast, Evergreen College. We were just there a week ago. Uh, KKFI in Kansas City and the Pacifica Radio Network, the five Pacifica stations, which I'll talk about. But I want to talk about KKFI in Kansas City because that was the station Leonard Peltier listened to every single morning, the Native American leader imprisoned for decades now in Florida, appealing once again for clemency from President Obama, also did from President Clinton. Um, have you heard of Leonard Peltier? You know, he was convicted of killing two FBI agents in 1975 on the Pine Ridge Reservation at the time of the standoff there. It was a crime he continues to this day to say he did not commit, but felt, and many human rights groups have felt the same way, the racism at the trial prevented any kind of justice. Um, so he was at Leavenworth for years, and every morning, uh, well, Dennis, our co-author, for a period of time, worked in his office in Lawrence, Kansas, in the uh, Leonard Peltier Justice Committee. And he would talk to Leonard every morning at 8, right after Leonard and, as Leonard put it, the brothers sat in the recreation yard, if you could call it recreation, and sat around a little transistor radio. It was the warden had gotten the regulation transistor radio so small you could hardly hear it and that they couldn't have anything bigger. And all these big guys would sit around and listen to Democracy Now! And then he wanted to discuss every day at eight what he heard. And he said throughout the day the prisoners would discuss what they heard. We were also just in Atlanta, Georgia um, at celebrating WRFG, Radio Free Georgia. And they just got a contribution of $325, which is really nice in a fundraising drive. But it came from 65 prisoners um, giving something like $5 each from the maximum security prison. 
I mean, this is why radio and independent media is so important as it knows no borders, you know, can penetrate uh, sometimes even the thickest walls. And just before we left on this tour, we got an email from a prison administrator in England. You know, Democracy Now! started on nine stations. We then, the week of September 11, 2001, happened to go on our first television station in New York as <coughs> emergency broadcasting. And as soon as we went on television, stations around the country asked if they could run us. We would put it on video cassette at the time. I didn't even think young people understand that word, but... Um, <laughs> And the FedEx guys would come. I insisted on FedEx because I thought it's breaking news. People shouldn't get it later than 25 hours, for 94 hours later. They would bring these huge, like, garbage bags filled with our video cassettes. They'd send them out. Uh, and soon, you know, the NPR station in town would say, what's that on TV? We want to run it. And then the PBS station in town. And now we are running, I mean, on both public television stations in San Francisco and Los Angeles and Washington, on 1,400 public television and radio stations around the country and around the world. Our headlines translate into Spanish in transcript form as well as audio form. If you're trying to learn Spanish or trying to learn English, put the English and the Spanish next to each other. It's a fantastic way to learn. And you'll be learning, you know, the the way of talking about the world, the politics of the world at the same time. Uh, we broadcast in Sweden many times a day on television, radio in Japan, we're called the Other America in South Africa, throughout Latin America. Um, and a station a week is picking us up. So about a year ago, we got this call from a prison administrator in England who asked us if they could run it on prison closed circuit television. We said, of course, just download it. We perfected this way to send this broadcast quality video through the internet. And um, he started running it. And right before we left on the tour, he emailed us and he said, they have a 50% increase in requests for, by the prisoners for classes. And they attribute that to Democracy Now!, just their yearning for more information in prison. Um, so, where I come from, Pacifica Radio, originally, though we're an independent organization now. You know, Pacifica began in 1949. The, um, a war resistor named Lou Hill came out of the detention camps. He was a conscientious objector, and he said, um, we need a media outlet that's not run by corporations that profit from war that's run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born. The first Pacifica station, KPFA, as George Gerbner, the late dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania would say, a media outlet not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. So KPFA 1949, KPFK 1959 in Los Angeles, WBAI in New York 1960. And in its first years of operation, WBAI was running a debate between James Baldwin, the great writer, and Malcolm X over the effectiveness of nonviolent civil disobedience, um, the effectiveness of the lunch counter sit-ins in the South. Then there was KPFT in, Bur in uh, Houston, Texas in 1970. And WPFW in Washington, 1977. That's the Fab Five. That's the Pacifica Radio Network in the United States. Um, kind of like the College Atlantic of the university system, Pacifica Radio of public broadcasting. So I want to talk about KPFT for a minute. KPFT in Houston, Texas. You know, when it went on the air in 1970, you know, a Pacifica radio station in the Petro Metro right there in Texas, it was blown off the air. Only radio station in the country to be blown up. Um, it was blown off the air by the Ku Klux Klan who strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. Um, right in the middle of Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant. <laughs> And I thought that was a good song, but anyway, so, so then they have to rebuild, right? And they take a few weeks um, to do this. Um, I mean, it's not like Pacific had money for advertising. This certainly blew it into the consciousness of the potential listening audience of the people of Houston. I don't recommend this as an advertising strategy, but, um, and so then they went back on the air. Uh, they're a little more well-known and the Klan blows it up again with 15 times the dynamite strapped to the base of the transmitter. So now it takes months. And in January of 1971, Pacifica, KPFT, 
goes back on the air. PBS has come to, you know, broadcast this moment. Arlo Guthrie comes into Houston to finish his song live on the air. Um, Alice's Restaurant, you know, and KPFT has been broadcasting ever since. I don't remember if it was the Exalted Cyclops or the Grand Dragon, because I often confuse their titles. But he said it was his proudest act. I think that's because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is, how dangerous independent media is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a child from Palestine or a grandmother from Israel, whether it's an aunt from Afghanistan, an uncle in Iraq, whether it's a kid from the South Bronx or from the South Valley of Albuquerque. We were just speaking at RFK High School in the South Valley where the overwhelming majority population of those high school students are undocumented immigrants. When you hear someone speaking from their own experience, it immediately challenges the stereotypes and caricatures that fuel the hate groups. You know, you say, it sounds like my bubba, my baby, my aunt, my uncle, and I'm not saying you will agree with them. Um, but you begin to understand where they're coming from. That understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war, which is why we have to take the media back. Now, I just told you a story about history, like 46 years ago, the story of the Ku Klux Klan in, in Houston, Texas. Um, I cannot believe that we are talking about the Ku Klux Klan today. In 2016, in the midst of this presidential election, how is it possible? How is it possible that the presumptive nominee of a major political party, right, Donald Trump, the Republican presumptive nominee, when asked on CNN whether he would disavow the support of a known white supremacist, an avowed Klan leader, right, David Duke, I can't remember if he was the exalted Cyclops or the Grand Dragon, but... <laughs> whether he would disavow support from David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan, Donald Trump waffled. He said he'd have to look more deeply into this. When was the last time you heard Donald Trump say he had to more, look more deeply into anything before he spoke? <laughs> but on this, he had to investigate, right? What was it he wanted to find out more about? Which Klan chapter it was, because he didn't want to generalize to all the KKK chapters in the United States. And this is terrifying. You couple this with the violence at his rallies. Now, I don't think a presidential candidate who has vast rallies is responsible for the action of every single person in that rally. I mean, but you set the tone, and if you make very clear that if anyone engages in violence, you condemn this. I mean, Bernie Sanders has said this. I won't support anyone in my rally who is involved with violence. But Donald Trump not only doesn't say this, he says he will pay the legal fees of his supporters that get arrested. So you have, you know, and he said this after one of his supporters sucker punched a Black Lives Matter activist and then said that the next time he would kill him. And Donald Trump says he'll pay his legal fees. I mean, the only uh, thing I took any um, solace in was that uh, Steve Brill, who is the legal reporter, publisher, um, said when he heard that, he found it amusing because uh, he never knew Donald Trump to pay his own legal bills. So, um, <laughs> but this is frightening. I mean, Donald Trump is ripping open the underbelly of hate in America. Um, it is a Pandora's box that is very terrifying. And we need a media that tells the stories and the accurate history of what these groups have done. I mean, I know young people, and certainly here at College of the Atlantic, you've heard of the Klan. But do you understand the horror? Do you understand the violence that it was involved with? 
I mean, I come from, you know, New York City. We were the closest national broadcast to Ground Zero, September 11th, 2001. That's when we first started going on television and people and networks wanted to run us all over. It was horrific, 3,000 people incinerated in an instant. Actually, we'll never know how many people died on that day because those who go uncounted in life go uncounted in death, the undocumented workers or immigrants who might have been in the area, but the number was horrifying. However, it wasn't the first time that terror came to US soil. Ask any African American about slavery, ask any Native American about what's happened in this country. Um, and the Ku Klux Klan is a homegrown American terror organization. It terrorized whole populations, particularly targeting African Americans, responsible for the deaths of thousands, the lynchings, the maimings. And we have to tell that story again in order for that history not to be repeated. Speaking of which, I want to go back to last June, to the horror that took place in South Carolina, Charleston, the massacre mid-June of the beautiful nine, as they came to be known, eight parishioners and their beloved pastor named Clemente Pinckney, who also was a, a South Carolina state senator. He came home midweek just to be in Bible study with his flock, with his parishioners. Just for an hour, they gathered together. They all knew each other well at Mother Emanuel, at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. And a young white man came in. They didn't know him, but they welcomed him. And he was with them for an hour, and then he blew them all away. And then, it, not all, sorry. He spared one woman's life because he told her he wanted her to bear witness to the world to tell the world what he had done, this young white supremacist who wrapped himself in a Confederate flag, to tell the world that he said he wanted to kill all the blacks. A few days later, Dylan Storm Roof would be arraigned, and the survivors and the loved ones of the victims put this country to shame when they forgave him. I think Dylan Storm Roof unwittingly blew the roof off of the Confederacy. So then the state legislature had to make a tough decision. Should we take down the Confederate flag that has flown on our grounds for more than half a century? And it would take time. It would take weeks. And I think the, if you ask most people in this country who is most responsible for taking down that flag, they'd probably say Governor Nikki Haley, right, the governor of South Carolina. But that wasn't who first took down that flag. It was a young 30-year-old African-American woman named Bree Newsom. And I want to tell you her story. But first, what happened next? Um, a few days after he was arraigned, State Senator Reverend Clemente Pinckney lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda in Columbia. Thousands streamed past to pay their respects. But first they had to pass the Confederate flag high, flying high on the Capitol grounds. Now understand, all the flags of South Carolina were flying at half-mast, except this one. See, it had flown above the Capitol building since the early 60s as a response to the civil rights movement, the Confederate battle flag. And then in 2000, the NAACP and some sports franchises said they'd boycott South Carolina if they didn't take it down. So this was the compromise. They would put it on the grounds instead of on top of the building, but there would be strings attached. You know, if anyone tried to deface it or pull it down, they would face increased prison time and increased fines. And it could never be unhooked. So it only flew at full mast. It was 5.30 in the morning on June 27, 2015, 10 days after the massacre at the Emanuel AME Church. The South Carolina State House glowed in the morning light. Bree Newsom, a 30-year-old African-American woman from Charlotte, North Carolina, walked toward the main entrance of the building. She was accompanied by Jimmy Tyson, a young white man from North Carolina, and others who scouted the grounds. They observed the scene around the State House, waiting until there were no guards visible. 
After about 30 minutes, Tyson and Newsom made their move. They walked swiftly toward the Confederate monument, which stands directly in front of the main steps. The tall monument topped with a heroic image of a Confederate soldier pays tribute to those who have glorified a fallen cause, slavery. The two activists proceeded to the 30-foot high flagpole that stood directly behind the monument. The Confederate battle flag flapped lazily at the top. Tyson helped Newsom over a fence, and then she donned her climbing gear, which she had learned how to use several days before. <laughs> she began ascending the pole swiftly. Reaching the top of the flagpole, as the guards noticed and began shouting at her to come down, she grabbed the Confederate flag and unhooked it. She declared, you come against me with hatred and oppression and violence. I come against you in the name of God. She then clutched the symbol of the Confederacy and said, this flag comes down today. She lowered herself slowly along with the flag. As soon as she reached the ground, Newsom and Tyson were arrested. <coughs> Video of the protest went viral was seen around the world. Her bail fund quickly raised more than $125,000. Ava DuVernay, director of the Oscar-nominated film Selma, was among the many to hail her, tweeting, I hope I get the call to direct the motion picture about a black superhero I admire. Her name is Brie Newsom. But within about an hour, two state house workers raised a new Confederate flag on the Capitol grounds. How could this be? The state deliberately once again raising this flag the day after the College of Charleston Arena was packed with thousands of people. I mean, we had raced down to Charleston right after the massacre. We broadcast from outside the AME Church. Go to democracynow.org. You'll see that amazing show. And then, of course, we went to the College of Charleston Arena. It was the mass funeral for everyone. President Obama was there. It was where he sang Amazing Grace. And the next day, the day of Bree's incredibly brave act, because don't forget, well, that day, there was supposed to be a Klan rally around the Confederate flag, and they carry guns. And she didn't know what would happen, whether to be more afraid of the guards, the armed guards, or the Confederate Klan. Um, but we were going to cover the individual funerals that Saturday, but instead we heard about this remarkable act. So we raced over from Charleston to Columbia, and we found the jail where um, Bree and Jimmy were being held. But these guards once again raised the Confederate flag as two hours away in Charleston, the victims were being lowered into the ground. So at the jailhouse, we somehow, prison, we somehow got into the arraignment cell where, G, where um, Bree and Jimmy were charged with defacing state property, facing a penalty of up to three years in prison and a $5,000 fine. We then went into the lobby where more and more people were gathering, hoping they would be released. And I talked to a young woman named uh, Tamika Lewis, who'd come down from North Carolina with Bree. And she said to see that flag actually come down and all the things it represents being taken down by a strong black woman was one of the greatest symbolic images one person could ever witness. Another young woman named Carol Parker from Columbia, she had never met Brie. She just heard about this act. She couldn't believe it. A young African-American woman who only knew a state capital where she grew up that flew the Confederate flag, that she walked past every day of her life feeling humiliated and denigrated. And she said, Brie has done what our governor hasn't had the courage to do, what our General Assembly hasn't had the courage to do. She went up there and did what had to be done when it needed to be done. Shout it from the rooftops. It was Brie Newsom who took down the symbol of the Confederacy in South Carolina. Um, that's just an example of why it is so important we know our history. Um, and I wanted to talk for a moment um, about an amazing phone call we got on election day in 2000. Um, when I was here before, I might have talked about this, but this was before we went to television, and we, it was election day when President Clinton was uh, the outgoing president. It was the day that Hillary Clinton was running for Senate, 
and Al Gore was running for president. Remember, this is 2000, Bush v. Gore. So we were in the studios of WBAI at the time, and it was just before the show broadcast. The producers were already in the control room, and the phone rang. And I, um, and I thought, well, this could, maybe this is an emergency. No one would call right before the show. So I picked up the phone. They said White House Communications. And I thought they said White Horse Communications. You see, the White Horse is a, oh, this like historic tavern in New York, in the village, where Dylan Thomas drank himself to death. And, um, and I said, oh, yes. I, I said, hurry. And so they said, well, the president would like to speak to you. And I think the president of a tavern <laughs> at nine in the morning? Are you kidding? And so I said, the president of what? And so... <laughs> They said, the President of the United States of America. Oh, White House communications. Oh, my gosh. Oh, really? The President Clinton? And so they said, yes. Uh, he, they said he wants to come on the phone, and he wants to come on your show and talk about getting out the vote. I didn't know if this was a hoax. I mean, is this ridiculous? And they're screaming at me to come in the control room like the music is already swelling. So I, sa I gave them the internal line. I said, sure, just have President Clinton call in. Hung up the phone, ran into the control room, and the music was swelling. And I said, from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! And we play a clip. And during the clip, I said to them, listen, President Clinton might call. Think of questions to ask him. He wants to talk about getting out the vote. Um, but it's probably a hoax, and I bet he'll never call. All that and more, coming up. <laughs> so, we, we broadcast the hour. Of course, he didn't call. And so then me, Maria Carrion, who'd flown in from Madrid to help us with the election season. She was our old producer, and Brad Simpson, who is a history grad student. They were our producers that day. So we finished the show, election day show. It's going to be a long day, because we're going to find out who's president at like, what, midnight or one in the morning. So we're going to have a really long day. And of course, that's not what would happen in 2000. It would be five weeks. It would be a selection by the Supreme Court, not an election. And um, uh, and Bush would be chosen in Bush v. Gore. But we were then racing out for coffee, which is something I love, um, coffee. That is what sustains me in addition to College of the Atlantic and my bakery experiences. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to race out for coffee. And as we're walking out the door, um, Gonzalo Alberto, who was doing Alternativa Latina that day, the Latino music show, I hear a yelp from the control room. The president is on the phone. Come back in. So we go tearing into the control room. Uh, he and his producer are there, and me and our producers, the two producers. And he's paralyzed. You, he has all the salsa faders up, the music faders up. All the microphones are down, and he can't move. And you hear the salsa music, and President Clinton is saying, is anyone there? Is anyone there? <laughs> So I didn't even know this audio board, but I threw all the music faders down. I had no idea which fader went to which mic, but I put them all up. So the whole room is hot, seven microphones. I said, okay, Gonzalo, this is it. Um, get ready to talk to the President of the United States. And so I said, yes, Mr. President. Uh, he said, yes. I said, well, um, I understand you're calling radio stations to get out the vote. Um, what do you say to those who feel that both the Democratic and the Republican parties are captured by corporations? And he answered. He really engaged. He had his response why people should get out and vote. And so then, uh, you know, he was still on the line, so I asked him, would you be granting clemency to Leonard Peltier? He had never been asked this in public, but we knew behind the scenes he was weighing this. Um, and he responded, and I asked him a little more about that. And then we asked him about, oh, would the U.S. Navy stop napalming and bombing the Puerto Rican island of Vieques? Um, and then we asked him uh, about <laughs> the two U.N. assistant secretary generals in charge of the U.S. pushed sanctions against Iraq. Remember at the time? That was when Secretary Albright was Secretary of State. She was asked by Leslie Stahl about the 500,000 Iraqi children who had died, and she asked her, do you think it's worth the price? And Secretary Albright said yes. It's a response she would later say she regretted. Um, but I asked President Clinton about this, and I said, both UN Assistant Secretary Generals have quit calling the sanctions against Iraq genocidal, and he responded to that. Um, and then I asked him about you know, coming off the campaign trail when he was running for president to go back to Arkansas to um, execute a mentally challenged man, a mentally handicapped man named Ricky Ray Rector. Um, I also asked him, you know, I said, uh, many people say, Ralph Nader was running for president then also, that you are responsible for Ralph Nader's success because they allege that you took the Democratic Party to the right. 
and then he got mad. And he said, um, I find you hostile, combative, and at times disrespectful. So I said, well then, I, I said, they're only critical questions and I only have a few more. So <laughs> then I asked, <laughs> then I asked him about, I asked him, um, I asked him, I said that Vice President Gore says if he becomes president, his first act in office will be to outlaw racial profiling, which is a good thing. I said, but you guys have been in office for eight years. Why haven't you done it until now? And he responded to that, and then he said he had to go, and so that wrapped up the Alternativa music show that day. Um, it got, it was over half an hour, it got a lot of headlines, right? And the next day we ran it on Democracy Now! So right after Democracy Now!, I got this call. You know, this is when we had wired phones, and I picked up uh, the phone. It was a call from New York Newsday, a reporter, and uh, he was saying, how the hell did you get, I mean, a half an hour with the president? You know, people dream, reporters, all their lives to have a few minutes with the president. Um, uh, we didn't have much time to dream, right? We had all of a few minutes to think that this was actually happening. But, um, and so I started to talk to him, but then the other phone rang. And so I picked up the phone, and I said, hello, and they said, White House Communications. And I knew it wasn't a tavern. And uh, <laughs> I said, oh, hi, how are you? And so they said, you're banned from the White House. I said, I said I'm said, i banned from the White House? I mean, he called me, I didn't call him. <laughs> so I said, wait a second, just one minute, please, I'm on the other phone. I said, Peter, I'm gonna have to call you back. I'm sorry, it's the White House. He said, do not hang up this phone. Do not put me on hold. You just put that phone down and I'll take it from there. It's okay, okay. It's only following orders. So I put the phone down and I said, okay, this isn't fair. I said, what do you mean I'm banned from the White House? So they said, because you broke every rule. We had an agreement. I said, an agreement? You called me up right before the show. I talked to you for all of 30 seconds. About half of that time, I thought you were a local bar in New York. <laughs> I said, I didn't make any agreement with you. And, uh, and they said, we made it very clear that he wanted to talk about getting out the vote. You asked questions one, four, and seven. This may be related to that, but nothing else related. I said, I asked three questions related to what the president wanted to talk about. They said, that's right. I said, I'm really falling down on the job. <laughs> And I said, anyway, it sounds like you have a transcript, like questions one, four, and seven. Could you send me the transcript? Because everyday volunteers make transcripts of our show, and we like, we'll make you our volunteer of the day, and we'd like to post the transcript online. We've been very busy fielding phone calls from reporters, and we want to have the exact transcript. Um, and they said, we're not kidding here. Um, and I said, I said, I don't understand. How many reporters did you actually, did President Clinton speak to in New York at radio stations? And they said, over 40. And so I said, and everyone only asked about getting out the vote? They said, that's right. And so I said, this is a very sad comment on American journalism, right? We are not supposed to be on bended knee. The person in power who's being interviewed does not get to determine everything we ask. And they said, furthermore, we told you he had two or three minutes, and you took more than half an hour. I said, oh my God, he's the leader of the free world. He's the most powerful person on earth. He could hang up if he wants to. <laughs> So that was the, uh, he, they said, we're not saying he didn't have a good time. <laughs> so, so that was the end of that. And uh, then, oh my God, I still had that phone call. So I picked it up. I said, I'm so sorry, Peter. He said, I don't need to talk to you anymore. I have everything I need. Goodbye. <laughs> But we are not supposed to be on bended knee. There's a reason why our profession, journalism, is the only one explicitly protected by the US Constitution. We're supposed to be the check and balance on power. And there's nothing more important right now than having the critical discussion about the critical issues of our day. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of this country. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us and civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the issues about whether they live or die, whether they're sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. So I wanna just talk about one year of major activism, and I'm gonna fly through this year. 
So forgive me if I talk super fast, but I also have to fly out today to get home to uh, broadcast the show in the morning. Then we're heading to Chicago for the next two days, then to Madison, Wisconsin, then to Toronto for the next two days after that, then to Troy, New York. Um, but uh, so just one quick thing. Speaking of these um, very fast uh, trips, we were... Um, we were, I was starting to tell this at some point, and I think I got a little distracted, going to San Francisco airport, and I got a call from Al Jazeera, um, AJ+. Plus. You know, does anyone see these videos from AJ+. Plus? So Al Jazeera America sadly folded, and I hope Al Jazeera doesn't follow suit, but AJ+, Plus is pretty successful. And it is still in the offices of the old Current TV. You know, Current was owned by Vice President Al Gore after he was Vice President. He sold the Current Network to Al Jazeera for half a billion dollars, and now Al Jazeera has folded. But um, his offices were in uh, San Francisco. So we're racing to the airport, and I get a call from AJ+. Plus. They say, can you come in and do an interview? I said, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, we're racing to the airport, can't do it. And they said, give us three minutes. I said, well, are you on the way to the airport? And they said, yes, we're right off the road. You can just come in. I said, I'm not kidding, three minutes. They said, we're not kidding either, three minutes. So I go, uh, I was driving with Dennis then. Dennis didn't even get to come inside. I sat down, did this interview for maybe five minutes, said hello to this crew in this half empty place, which is so sad. I saw Al Gore's offices where they used to be, ran out, and we made it to the airport. Um, that interview... They posted last week online at AJ+. A few days later, I checked, and it was at 11.7 million views. I mean, it went viral, and I was just talking about the elections, and I am sure it's not that different for what any of you think. I mean, across the political spectrum, it just doesn't hit the corporate media radar screen. These elections... Um, the media's coverage is obscene the way they've been covering them. Well, first of all, the unfairness. Look at the Tyndall report. In two, I mean, Donald Trump is piped into everyone's home. The other candidates have to trudge from one state to another. Um, I was also invited on CNN to discuss this. And at first, I was just going to critique CNN. But I said, frankly, I can't tell the difference between CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. Because Donald Trump sounds the same on all three networks, you know, with that lower third breaking news, breaking news. Unless they're static uh, on the show, it's the same thing. And... The Tyndall Report looked at the full coverage of 2015. Trump got 23 times the coverage of Bernie Sanders. I think ABC World News Tonight gave Trump 81 minutes that year, Sanders 20 seconds. I'd like to know what Sanders did that was so newsworthy for that 20 seconds. But anyway, um, let's look at one primary night, March 15th. That was a major five-state primary. It was... Ohio, Florida, North Carolina, Illinois, and Missouri. Big deal. It was a big deal. All the networks were doing wall-to-wall -wall coverage that night, as they should. And, you know, that was when Senator Marco Rubio of Florida... Remember Senator Marco Rubio? Yeah. <laughs> he lost his home state, right? And so he pulled out. And they played that concession speech, and they played the whole thing, as they should have. That was when... Governor John Kasich um, won his only primary, right? That was, uh, at the time, Ohio. Remember Governor Kasich? And, uh, and so he gave his victory speech, and they played it. Ted Cruz gave his speech. Um, Hillary Clinton had won Ohio, Florida, and North Carolina, and it was good that she played her, gave her speech then because she was ahead. The other two states, her home state of Illinois and Missouri, neck and neck with Sanders, neck and neck. They weren't going to be able to tell till late into the night, and she gave her speech. And then they were waiting for Donald Trump. And he, they all had this upper square in the right of the empty podium in one of his Florida mansions. And, you know, he's not there, he's not there, he's not there. And all the pundits are talking, you know, all on all the networks. You know these pundits who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. Um, and so they're filling the airtime. And finally, Donald uh, Trump, you know, ascends the stage and he speaks. And he says it's going to be a news conference. Of course, it doesn't take any questions from the press. But you know he's pioneered this. It's going to be a news conference. Like a few weeks before that, he held that hour news conference from the other Florida mansion. There he was trumpeting Trump water, Trump steaks, Trump magazines. The media never cut away uh, for a full hour. It was like this bizarre, bizarre. Um, and Hillary Clinton actually spoke in the middle of it, and they recorded her, and they didn't cut away, and they played her after. Okay, so we're back to that half hour. He gives a speech on March 15th, and that pretty much wrapped it up, right? That's all the major candidates, Trump, Rubio, and Clinton, Kasich, and Cruz. There was no one else. Was there? 
Um, oh my gosh, Bernie, Bernie who? Oh, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders, okay. Because um, I did see some buttons and t-shirts. Um, <laughs> Bernie Sanders, you know, there's something worse than negative coverage. It's no coverage at all. It's the vanishing. Where was he? They didn't even speculate where he was. I mean, had he just like fallen asleep? And I mean, that would make Arianna Huffington very happy because she just wrote this new book called The Sleep Revolution. Um, and I was actually on the Bill Maher show a few weeks ago with her and Susan Sarandon. And I challenged her to a duel or to a debate or something. I said, I want to talk about the merits of sleeplessness. And this really annoyed her. And she said, this is not funny. And so I said, OK, I promise I will take a long nap in June. <laughs> so, um, but what happened to Bernie Sanders that night? I mean, did he take the night off? Well, in this 100 city tour, we were also, we went all through Arizona. We were in Flagstaff, Tucson, and Phoenix. So I know this for a fact because so many people in those places were at his speech the night of March 15th in Phoenix where thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people were. It doesn't matter if you're for him or against him. It was just a fact. And he gave a major address. They didn't even suggest he was somewhere in any of these networks. Like, where's Bernie? And so that night we decided, you know, we weren't going to do this. But the next morning on Democracy Now!, we would play an excerpt of the speech of Bernie Sanders in Phoenix. <coughs> Who would have thunk it that it would be a revolutionary act to simply play an excerpt of a speech of a major party candidate on a major primary night or the morning after? But that's what it has become, and it's unacceptable. The guy has broken so many records. I mean, whether he wins or not, and winning can be defined in a lot of different ways because there is a movement that has grown, not that he created, but that he has ridden. Uh, comes before him out of Occupy, the concern of people across this country about the growing inequality in the world, not to mention many other issues. Um, but. Just in March, he raised $44 million, compare it to Hillary Clinton's $29 million. He's raising it from over 6 million donors. He's breaking every record, and people are giving three, nine, seven, average $27 so they don't max out, so they can keep on giving. Hillary, and he does it on the campaign trail, transparently just says give. Hillary Clinton has a much smaller group of donors. She has to go off the campaign trail behind closed doors. A number of them max out. Um, you know, we were in Laurel Canyon, California, and so was she, but we weren't in the same place. She was at a party at the house of George and Amal Clooney, right? And um, I think the going seat for a seat at the head table was $350,000. I mean, that's for a couple, but, um, <laughs> uh, and so when, when uh, George Clooney was asked about this on the networks, even he said it was obscene, and he threw the party. Um, the massive amounts of money these candidates have to raise or are raising, where is the money going to? Well, the fact of the matter is, and only at College of Atlantic people say, yes, it's going to the networks. It's lining the pockets of the places that are covering them. So do you think they're going to, in any serious way, raise the issue of the corrupting influence of money in politics? It's going to them. So a couple of weeks ago in Washington, and maybe some of you were there, Democracy Spring, Democracy Awakening, over 1,200 people were arrested in Washington uh, protesting, you know, following in the footsteps of Granny D, protesting money and politics and what it's doing, drowning our democracy. Not only were they talking about this, but the, as they're being dragged away, they're saying, where's CNN? Where's MSNBC? You know, where is the coverage of this issue? Even them, more than a thousand people arrested. Could you imagine if a thousand people were arrested in central Havana? You'd have every major network anchor flying down. They can go directly now to Cuba, uh, flying down to talk about this repressive regime that has just arrested 1,200 people. I mean, and here they were in the nation's capital raising this issue. They didn't even cover why they were there in any systematic, sustained way. And that's why we need independent media that's not profiting from the status quo. You know, we need a media when we cover war and peace that's not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers. When we cover inequality, when we cover, oh, health care that's not brought to you by the insurance industry or big pharma, when we cover climate change not brought to you by the oil, the gas, the nuclear, the coal companies, we need an independent media. So 
Back to this one year that I want to talk about, 2011. I'm going to race through it. Um, but I'm going to start in December 2010. A young man in Tunisia named Mohamed Bouazizi comes out of the university. The country is run by a corrupt dictator. He has no opportunity, Mohamed, so he goes into the marketplace the, to sell fruits and vegetables. The authorities harass him. They steal his scales. He can't take it anymore, so he sets himself on fire. And that is the spark of the Tunisian revolution. Oh, there was something else. Um, WikiLeaks as well. You know WikiLeaks, founded by Julian Assange, who on June 19th will be in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he has political asylum, for four years. And if you watch or listen to Democracy Now! regularly, you know I go there periodically to interview Julian. He is afraid if he steps outside, um, he will be arrested and ultimately extradited to the United States, where we believe there's a sealed indictment against him. He's afraid he will be charged with treason. He's afraid he could be jailed for many years, if not the rest of his life. WikiLeaks deeply believes that transparency serves a democratic society. And so they've released the, Iraq, released the Iraq war logs, the Afghan war logs, the State Department cables, millions of them. Um, if you think he's paranoid, you know, what do you mean he'd be arrested and jailed for so long? Does the name Chelsea Manning ring a bell? And what's astounding is, even as Chelsea Manning was being court-martialed, you know, you couldn't hear Chelsea Manning's voice for years after Manning was taken from Iraq as a young U.S. soldier and then brought to Kuwait and then to Quantico, where many say he was tortured. Um, it, was he, it was he at the time, Bradley Manning, he transitioned in prison and is now Chelsea Manning. Um, but Edward Snowden witnessed this whole thing, and it shows how brave Snowden is. He, he saw what happened to Manning, that you could never hear Manning's voice to even justify what Manning was doing. We, of course, got a secret copy of a recording of Manning in court, and we played it, even though you can hardly understand it, just to dramatize that you cannot hear this person's voice anymore. Um, so Snowden sees all this and has documents of his own, right? He was an NSA contractor. And he feels it's critical that the U.S. public debate something he sees that he feels many people don't understand, which is the all-encompassing, all-seeing eye of the U.S. government, that it's spying on the American people. And he feels, he doesn't have an answer, but he says the American people have to know this and debate it if we live in a democratic society. And he thought if he releases these documents here, they won't get released. So he left the country, went to Hong Kong, and he communicated with two journalists we didn't know, Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald, and they ultimately went to Hong Kong. They were very brave to do this. They had no idea who this guy was or this woman. He, they didn't know who it was. They, he called himself Citizen Four. And um, they went, they vid videoed him, they got the documents, and they, with him, most importantly, changed the world, changed the whole discussion, right? Um, because they released these documents. Actually, afterwards, um, we're going to be signing books, and we have a DVD. Um, Maya Nermeen Sheikhs, uh, Nermeen has been the co-host of Maksha for the last five years, interview with Glenn, and it's fantastic. It's more than an hour, and if you get two books, you get a copy of the DVD. You could get two books, give one to a library, give one to a father for Father's Day, whatever. You can get one book or no books, but why would you get two books? So let me just say a quick thing about the politics of publishing. The book came out April 12th, and we were amazed it debuted on the New York Times bestseller list, which is absolutely amazing, considering that the New York Times almost never mentions democracy now, ever, even though you know, we think that Webster's will redefine the word exclusive to be heard on democracy now the year before. Um, <laughs> But, uh, so we call this book Democracy Now!, so it would be in the pages of the paper of record, and they couldn't determine it, because this is just a mathematical equation. But there's something more serious about this. To be on the New York Times bestseller list means, I mean, unlike Sherman's, and I have very fond feelings about Sherman's being here and hanging out there uh, for so long in the years that I was here, um, that most places are not like that, or Longfellow Books in Portland, um, or Bookstacks in Bucksport. Um, they many bookstores only, pub only stock the bestsellers. You don't even realize it when you go into these stores. Even libraries with their cutbacks only do the bestsellers. And we want to get into these places because very fine people go to these places to challenge their imaginations. And we want to be there to show them 
that there are other universes and galaxies of independent thought, of independent media, and provide a kind of roadmap. And so this is how we do it at a very grassroots level. But if you don't want to get a book at all, that is fine too. Come up and say hi. If you have story ideas, you can also email them to stories at democracynow.org. If you want to sign up for our daily digest list, we have the daily digest uh, that is going through. It gives you our news headlines every day. And um, uh, if you don't want to do it by paper, I think we're passing them through the audience. Um, you can do it uh, by texting the word democracy now, one word, to 66866. It'll ask for your email, give it, and then you're signed up. You approve it in your email. That's the word democracy now, one word, to 66866. And if you send out any photos or texts or tweets about what's happened today, if you use the hashtag covering the movements, and that way we keep track of this journey. So the, it's 66866 to text the word, one word, democracy now, too. Um, so... Yes, Edward Snowden, he leaves the country, he releases the documents, and he challenges so much about what we think our government is doing. Why would WikiLeaks have anything to do with the Tunisian revolution? Because the documents, not like the Tunisians didn't understand that their dictator was corrupt, but they saw the US government understood it and still shored him up to the tune of millions of dollars, just increase their anger. And Tunisian revolution, they throw out their dictator, that sparks the Egyptian revolution, and that was historic. In 18 days, they throw out their long reigning dictator, Mubarak, What's happened since is deeply troubling. Many of the young activists are now in jail. It's an unfinished revolution. But I think the Arab Spring then helped to inspire Wisconsin, the uprising there. I mean, Governor Walker did also. <laughs> right? Governor Scott Walker is elected, and then he says he's going to bust the public unions. 150,000 people come out in the freezing Wisconsin winter. They take over the state capitol. He says he's going to bust the teachers and the nurses unions, not the police and the firefighters. He assured them, you're fine. The problem for Walker was that the police and the firefighters were married to the teachers and the nurses. <laughs> and so they all rose up. And we raced to Wisconsin. It was an amazing scene. We saw some of the biggest guys we had ever seen in this uprising, the Oshkosh prison guards. And I went up to them. I said, who did you vote for? And they said, Governor Walker, of course. So I said, so what are you doing here? And they said, protesting Governor Walker, of course. <laughs> Outside, 150,000 people, this older guy, white hair, glasses, marching with a homemade sign that says, IRS auditors against Walker. <laughs> you knew he was in trouble. Um, so, but Wisconsin's an interesting place, right? It's the home of the John Birch Society, the racist, segregationist, anti-civil rights, anti-king organization that was co-founded by Fred Koch, the father of the oil barons, Di David and Charles Koch. It is also, though, the home of AFSME, 1932, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees. As I looked out on this vista of protest across the grounds from the Capitol is the State Labor History Museum. So many movements coming together. Um, Civil rights and labor history you might not think of together, but go to April 4th, 1968, the day Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Why was he there? He was simply there to stand with sanitation workers who were trying to organize a local of AFSME. Go back a year to the day before that, April 4th, 67, Dr. King speaking at Riverside Church in New York, taking on the Vietnam War. His inner circle said, don't do this, Martin. You've got the most powerful person on earth, President Johnson, wrapped around your finger. You got him to sign the Voting Rights Act. You got him to sign the Civil Rights Act. Don't alienate him now. This war isn't your war. And he said, no. He said he saw the war at home linked to the war abroad, and he wanted to take on the triple threat of racism, militarism, and materialism. And he spoke out to this crowd of thousands in Riverside Church, and he said the country he loved, the United States, was the greatest purveyor of violence on earth. He was excoriated by the mainstream press. I mean, I have the Life magazine issue, Time magazine, the Washington Post. They said his speech sounded like a script out of Radio Hanoi. They said he had done a disservice to his cause, his country, and his people. So he just doubled down, spoke louder, spoke more often against the war, and he would be gunned down a year later. And now I want to jump to the summer of 2011. Washington, ring around the Rose Garden, the massive protests against the Keystone XL pipeline. 
um, you know, people in Washington, 1,200 people are arrested. Among them, Naomi Klein, who gave the graduation address here last year, right? Fantastic author, activist. It was her first arrest. And she did this, her, read every book she's written. Read This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. Read The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. Read No Logo, Taking Aim at Brand Bullies. Bill McKibben was arrested, right? The co-founder of 350.org and so many others. Um, and then jump forward three weeks. We're in September 17, 2011. Thousands stream into Zuccotti Park. They occupy Wall Street. It was amazing. They set up an encampment. The corporate media just did the vanishing. Nothing. For about a week. And then, you know, I mean, the media moguls are driving by in their limousines. You've got the elite journalists. We're in the media metropolis of the world. It's not like they were just occupying Bar Harbor, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. And then they start to. They have to. And I remember Erin Burnett had just started um, Out Front, her show on CNN. Her first piece on Occupy was Seriously. So they start to mock Occupy. And they say, oh my God, what do these people represent? They can't even decide. Like they're against the death penalty, they're against war, they're against racism, they're against inequality, they're concerned about climate change. I thought, oh my God, the media's listening. <laughs> yes. All of those things, like Dr. King, they see it as a seamless web, that they're all connected. And then they would say they can't even decide on their spokespeople. Well, it's a leaderful movement. It is not a leaderless movement. Then the police eviscerate the encampments. I mean, I was in Louisville. I was in New York. I was at Occupy Oakland. And, you know, it was a coordinated effort. And... Um, but that didn't wipe out the movement, as the media said. You know, what did this amount to, a hill of beans? No, it amounted to so much more, uh, just let's look at 2016 presidential election, but so much more. You know, they occupied the language. I think the word occupy was like the most looked up or the most used word of 2011. You say the word 1%, you say the word 99%, absolutely everyone knows what you mean. You change the language, you change the world. And then four days later, well, many of the signs that people held at Occupy said, I am Troy Davis and too much doubt. So we raced from Zuccotti Park to Jackson, Georgia. How many of you know who Troy Davis was? Troy Anthony Davis. On September 21st, 2011, Troy Davis was scheduled to die. We were reporting live from the grounds of Georgia's death row prison in Jackson, awaiting news whether the US Supreme Court would spare his life. I am Troy Davis became this rallying cry. It was a growing international movement to stop his execution. It wasn't just traditional anti-death penalty activists. Now prosecutors, prison wardens, a former US president and the Pope were calling for a stay of execution against Troy Anthony Davis. This was a movement against death that refuses to die. <coughs> Troy Davis was a young man who grew up in Savannah, Georgia, um, with his three sisters, his brother, his dad, who was a Korean War vet, a carpenter, his mom worked in a local hospital. On the night of August 18, 1989, 18-year-old Troy, who was African-American, went to Charlie Brown's pool hall with a friend. In the parking lot outside, a local tough named Red Coles and was arguing loudly with a homeless man named Larry Young. Several witnesses testified Coles pistol whipped Young. Pool hall patrons streamed out. Uh, Troy came out to try to break up the fight, but fled when Coles threatened him with a gun. At a quarter after one in the morning, Mark McPhail, a white off-duty Savannah police officer who was working as a security guard at a Greyhound bus station next door, came outside to break up the fight. Gunshots pierced the summer night. Moments later, McPhail lay dying with a bullet wound to the head and another to the heart. He never drew his gun. Mark McPhail was a hero cop. He tried to save this homeless man. The question was, who killed Mark McPhail? Red Coles immediately raced to the police station with his lawyer and pointed the finger at Troy Davis. Now, Troy Davis didn't know this. He had gone to Atlanta to look for a job with his cousin. Suddenly, his face is plastered over the newscasts of Savannah, and his family is desperate. They call Troy. His older sister goes to get him in Atlanta. His older sister named Martina Crea, she is a heroine. I have interviewed her so many times. 
Martina was a Persian Gulf Army uh, nurse. She came back to this country because she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She doesn't just fight for her own life. She then, her face adorns all the mammogram vans of Savannah to get black women and poor women to get mammograms. She is honored as a leading light in Washington with Nancy Pelosi. But now her brother is in trouble. She races to Atlanta, gets him, they come back, and this 18-year-old teenager goes in to the Chatham County Sheriff's Office, turns himself in and says, this is a case of mistaken identity, I just need to clear up the confusion. Of course, instead, he is charged with murder. He's held for two years, and then he is tried. The jury deliberates for two hours, and they return a guilty verdict. On August 30th, 1991, Troy Anthony Davis, age 20, was sentenced to die. Davis would spend the next 20 years on death row. During that time, seven of the nine non-police witnesses recanted their testimony saying, many of them saying they were pressured by the police to give false testimony. The one who didn't recant was Red Coles, the one who many pointed the finger at. In fact, there was no physical evidence that linked Davis to the shooting. So let's go to that day, September 21st. We had no idea what would happen. We're on the grounds of the prison. Um, Troy had three death warrants before, and all of them had been vacated within hours of his life. But on this day, who knew what would happen? If we could have broadcast from the execution chamber, we would have. I deeply believe that if you see the images, if the people of this country understand how alone we are in the industrialized world, in carrying out state killing, that it could open up a discussion. I mean, we couldn't get into the death chamber, but we were on the grounds of the prison. And they, the prison guards had set up a protest pen for 150 protesters. Martina was in the middle, in a wheelchair now. She would die weeks later of breast cancer. Other human rights leaders around her, oh, the head of Amnesty, the head of F, NAACP, there were protests in Iceland, Germany, England, France, Japan. Um, Thousand people were outside the grounds. The students from Morehouse, Dr. King's alma mater, from Spelman, they were all holding candles, people from around the world. So, you know, this was extremely serious. And there was no studio around. We had to cover this like the big boys did. So we rented a satellite truck from Atlanta. We didn't know who they were. CNN gets them. Fox would get them the next day. We had them now. We saw all the satellite trucks were on the periphery of the grounds but how could they speak to the protesters? The guards had pushed them there. They didn't really fight back because, you know, they're going to speak for maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds, but not democracy now. We're going to be there for the whole night, and we didn't go to broadcast our own voices. We wanted to be there to go to where the silence was. It's not really silent. It just doesn't hit the corporate media radar screen. Why were all these people here? We wanted to broadcast their voices, but we couldn't do it from the periphery. And I was incredibly annoyed because the satellite truck was late. It finally came up on the grounds. It pulls up and they roll down the window. Where do you want the truck, ma'am? So I said, well, the prison guards are saying that you have to go over there. Now, where do you want the truck, ma'am? I I'm starting to warm up a little here. <laughs> well, we want it over at the protest pen because that's where all the people are. And they barrel this truck over to the <laughs> protest pen. The prison guards come running out and then these guys get out. They're the videographers and satellite truck operators. They were bigger than the Oshkosh prison guards. <laughs> And the guards backed off. And these guys hand me the microphone. They say, where do you want to stand? So I said, well, I was thinking about just like standing right against the rope so I could interview everyone. So they form a kind of protective semicircle around me. And they said, start the show. <laughs> so the Department of Corrections had given us a press packet. It was very thin, but it described how Troy would spend his last day. He would meet with his family until 3 o'clock, but then they would have to clear out because then he had to have a routine physical. <laughs> routine physical? The state's going to kill him in four hours. Do they really care if what his cholesterol levels are? <laughs> but that's what they said. Um, the next page described what he would have for dinner. Um, he had been offered the special meal. Um, you know, you can choose whatever you want if you're going to be executed, like ice cream and steak and stuff. But um, he had said no. So in the press release, it described the standard fare that Troy Davis would be offered. It said, quote, grilled cheeseburgers, oven brown potatoes, baked beans, coleslaw, cookies, and a grape beverage. Um, 
You know, I mean, the horror of the death penalty, the case of a young man who was mentally challenged, who was being put to death, and, um, you know, he got a special meal, he ordered everything he wanted, and then the guard said, you know, you only ate the beginning, don't you want the ice cream at the end? He said, I'm saving that for after the execution. But that just shows, I mean, how horrifying. But so this is what Troy would be offered. Very particular, the cookies, the grape beverage, the baked beans, oven brown potatoes, and grilled cheeseburgers. The next page in the press packet listed the lethal cocktail that would follow. It was just four lines. It said pentobarbital, pancuronium bromide, potassium chloride, and ativan, in parentheses, a sedative. The pentobarbital anesthetizes, the pancuronium bromide paralyzes, the potassium chloride stops the heart. Davis refused the sedative and the Last Supper. By 7 p.m., the U.S. Supreme Court was reportedly reviewing Davis's plea for a stay. The case was referred to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who hails from Pinpoint, Georgia, a community founded by freed slaves that's near Savannah, where Troy grew up. The Supreme Court denied the plea. Davis's execution began at 10.53 p.m. A prison spokesperson delivered the news to the reporters outside, time of death, 11.08 p.m. The eyewitnesses to the execution stepped out. According to an Associated Press reporter who was there, these were Troy Davis's final words. He said, I'd like to address the McPhail family, let you know I'm not the one who killed your son, your father, your brother. It was not my fault. I did not have a gun. All I can ask is that you look deeper into this case so that you really can finally see the truth. He said, I ask my family and friends to continue to fight the fight. And then he looked at his executioners and said, for those about to take my life, God have mercy on your souls. May God bless your souls. The state of Georgia took Davis's body to Atlanta for an autopsy, charging the family for the transportation. On Troy Davis's death certificate, the cause of death is listed simply as homicide. As we stood on the grounds of the prison, it was about quarter to midnight. We'd been broadcasting for over five hours, just after Troy Davis was executed. The Georgia Department of Corrections threatened to pull the plug on our broadcast. The show was over. I was reminded of what Mahatma Gandhi reportedly answered when asked what he thought of Western civilization. He said, I think it would be a good idea. And then I want to end in December of 2011 at the Durban, South Africa, UN Climate Summit. You know if you watch and listen to Democracy Now!, um, like a number of the students here, Democracy Now! is at every UN Climate Summit. Um, we started in Copenhagen and then went to Cancun. And then we went to the People Summit in Cochabamba in Bolivia. Um, then we went to Durban in 2011, to Doha in 2012, to Poland in 2013, to Peru in 2014, and then we were in Paris. Given what happens inside the UN Summit, you might ask, why do we waste the fuel? but it's because mainly of what happens outside. The thousands of people who come from across the planet, from the most endangered areas, from the frontline states who are most endangered by climate change. You know, the 15-year-old kid from the Maldives who comes and says, my country will be submerged from the rising waters. Um, the people of sub-Saharan Africa who say, you are cooking our continent. You are desertifying the whole continent. And it's not as if we don't suffer from climate change in this country. It's just that the events, the weather events are so disparate. How do you connect the extreme cold of the, bless you, the extreme cold of the Northeast, the fires of the Northwest in California, the dust bowl conditions of the Midwest, the thousand year flood in Colorado, the um, Hurricane Irene almost drowning Vermont. 
How do people connect it? They would connect it if the meteorologists on television, for whom so many tune in to television and radio, if they simply, instead of just flashing the words severe weather and extreme weather, also flash the words global warming and climate change. Until they make this connection, they should have their, whatever licenses they get to be meteorologists, they should have them revoked. I mean, it's not just about tuning in to find out what to wear each day. It's what do we do about it. Now, in the rest of the world, where they're so much more advanced in their understanding about climate change, sure, they have debates. They have debates about what to do about it. In this country, I mean, in this country, the debate is whether human beings have anything to do or fossil fuels have anything to do with climate change. It's as if every time we talked about the planet Earth, we brought on someone from the Flat Earth Society for balance. <laughs> the science is settled. So it was amazing. In Durban, South Africa, something unusual happened at the end of the conference. You know, the people who are outside, who are so often, well, unaccredited and not allowed in, but the people who are outside were also invited in. And sometimes they go back and forth if they're not arrested midstream. Um, and it was this year uh, that we had this amazing experience as we were just about to go to broadcast to hear that in the UN Climate uh, Assembly, the young people were going to address the world body. And you saw the young people stream in, and they chose as their spokesperson a College of the Atlantic student named Anjali Pottery. And she got up and she mesmerized the assembly. This is a part of what Anjali said. She looked out at the world body and said, I speak for more than half the world's population. We're the silent majority. You've given us a seat in this hall, but our interests are not on the table. What does it take to get a stake in this game? Lobbyists, corporate influence, money? You've been negotiating all of my life. You failed to meet pledges, you've missed targets, you've broken promises, but you've heard this all before. She said, we're in Africa, home to communities on the front line of climate change. The science tells us we have five years max. You're saying, give us 10. The starkest betrayal of your generation's responsibility to ours is that you call this ambition. She said, where is the courage in these rooms? Now is not the time for incremental action. In the long run, these will be seen as the defining moments of an era in which narrow self-interest prevailed over science, reason, and common compassion. She said, there is real ambition in this room, but it's been dismissed as radical, deemed not politically possible. Stand with Africa. Long-term thinking is not radical. What's radical is to completely alter the planet's climate, to betray the future of my generation, to condemn millions to death by climate change. What's radical is to write off the fact that change is within our reach. 2011 was the year in which the silent majority found their voice, the year when the bottom shook the top. 2011 was the year when the radical became reality. And then she quoted Nelson Mandela, who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. So she looked down on the sea of faces and said, so distinguished delegates and governments around the world, governments of the developed world, deep cuts now, get it done. And then she did an Occupy mic call with all the young people in the audience, and then they all swarmed out. And as they were coming out, we did not have any idea who this person was. I mean, but the eloquence, the shock in the room, even the head of the UN Assembly after she spoke, um, the cop president uh, said, on a purely personal note, I wonder why we let not speak half the world's population first in this conference, but only last. And then we saw Anjali the next year in um, Doha. And I said to her, so um, you want to come in and do an interview? And she said, I can't, I'm banned. Um, and of course, then, because of tremendous protests and the effects she had, they lifted the ban. But that also says some to, something to you about the conferences and the resistance. But the resistance is what ultimately will win. When she came off the stage, we had just rushed over. We were about to go to broadcast. I had no idea who this person was, but I knew that we wanted to talk to her. And as she's coming off the stage and marching out with all the youth. I said to her, what's your name? And she said, Angelia Padre. And I said, where are you from? And she said, Maine. And she, I said, you're a 
student said yes. I said, where? She said, oh, you wouldn't know anything about it. She said, it was so funny. And she said, I said, in Maine? She said, yes. She said, I said, where? And she keeps walking. I said, no, really, can you tell me what school you're from? And she said, it's a place called College of the Atlantic. I said, oh my God. <laughs> um, if you ever think for a moment here on this tip of the country, you know, we have traveled from, um, oh, from Washington State to Washington, D.C., from Sarasota to Seattle. We've traveled from, um, well, all areas of this country and now to Bar Harbor. If you, only, if you ever think this neck of the woods doesn't make a difference, think about what Margaret Mead said, never doubt for a moment that a small group of thoughtful, committed people indeed can change the world. And yes, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, you know, the fact that Anjali was there and that Democracy Now! was also there, we're the only national global broadcast to do a daily broadcast from the UN summits every single day. Um, and we broadcast her words. We need a media that is the exception to the rulers. You know, we need a media that cuts through the static, that veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality, when what we need the media to give us is the dictionary definition of static, criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. I want to end just in a two-minute story back in World War II where we began, but this in Nazi Germany. There was a brother and sister named Hans and Sophie Scholl. Together with their professor and some other students, they thought, what can we do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? They weren't Jewish, they were German Christians. And together with students and workers, they formed the White Rose Collective. And they decided to put out a series of pamphlets. And on one of those pamphlets were written the words, we will not be silent. And they distributed them everywhere under cover of night, in marketplaces, in schoolyards, in alleyways, and then they were captured. They were captured by the Gestapo, they were charged, they were tried, they were convicted, and they were beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of the media today, should be the Hippocratic Oath of us all today. We will not be silent. Democracy now. <laughs> <laughs>